It's human nature to be selfish and to pursue private interests over all else. Or perhaps it isn't. At least that's the case according to Rutger Bregman, who in his latest book, Humankind, A Hopeful History, says that the prevailing arguments have got it wrong, that humans are fundamentally good, and that, as a result, we should recalibrate how we organise society. Rutger, welcome to Navarra. Thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Uh, now, if, if Rutger looks familiar to our Navarra <laughs> audience this evening, uh, that's probably because, uh, you know, we have spoken to him before. He was uh, kind enough to come on and talk about his last book, Utopia for Realists. But let's be real. It's probably because you saw him in that viral clip after speaking in Davos in January 2019. Let's watch that quickly. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water. I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's we gotta be talking about taxes. Yeah, exactly. That's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. Now that led to appearances on Fox News, I believe, is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you joined our very own Andrew Neil here in the UK on the BBC. You were kind enough to say that Navarra uh, were one of the better outlets to cover the book. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how have you dealt with your newfound fame? Because you, uh, you know, this may seem like kind of brown nose, and we call it in, in British English, but uh, it does feel like in the last year you've become one of the most prominent younger intellectuals in in Europe. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit strange, obviously, that you have these like two. 15 seconds of fame and uh that's what people know you for but uh i mean i don't regret it uh, especially the davos thing i guess um uh, i was just saying there what everyone was already thinking right just the extraordinary hypocrisy of, of uh the elites gathered there and, and no one's talking about tax avoidance and everyone's talking about i don't know climate change and feminism blah 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 but not mentioning the elephant in the room mm. uh so i'm really glad that i could sort of play a role there and uh, move the conversation in the right direction it, is public profile something that you you seek? Because obviously, uh, as an intellectual, which I, you know, mm -hmm. I thought the first book was one of the big sort of post crisis books. I thought I don't know how it went down in in the Netherlands, but definitely in, in the English language, it's definitely one of the big crisis post crisis books. Activists read it. You know, you, mm -hmm. there was a uh, that brilliant picture with Rupert Murdoch, politicians, <laughs> civil servants. You know, is that is that something you think? All oh, right, now I have this profile. I can I, I, that helps my message, or do you, do you find it hinders it? Because oft, often it's something that really splits opinion on writers, whether mm. they want to pursue a bigger profile or, or not. Well, I sort of have a double feeling about this. You know, on the one hand, I really want to reach an audience as large as possible, right? Because I think that ideas can and do change the world. But then it matters that you actually speak in a language that people understand, right? I always believe that it's relatively easy to make things more difficult or more complex, but it's quite difficult to make things a bit easier. Uh, I mean, not too simple, obviously. You don't want to simplify things. Uh, but you actually do want to reach an, uh, a larger audience so that your ideas can actually have an effect. Um, now, with this book, it's a little bit strange. I, when I published it in September last year in uh, the Netherlands, people were like, okay, so you had this fight with Tucker Carlson, and now you're publishing a book about the power of friendliness? Now, human beings have evolved to be friendly. I mean, what's going on here? Because you weren't exactly that friendly to Tucker Carlson. Um, I think this is sort of the big paradox of the whole book is that on the one hand, I do argue that humanity has evolved to be friendly and that this is our true super uh, secret superpower. Um, but on the other hand, real progress often comes from people who are willing to be unfriendly, who are willing to be nasty and difficult and to go against the status quo, go against sort of the group. Um, and that's often where progress comes from. Yeah, no, it's a really, it's a really great point. I mean, I saw you discuss this briefly on, on the Channel 4 show you did. I'm not going to mention it again because obviously I think everybody should watch this interview and instead it'll be much better. But it, it's so true, you know, dissenters, heretics, you know, Galileo, um, mm. Isaac Newton, you know, Descartes. Th these were people that pushed, sorry, just name white men, but in the context of, you know, early yeah. modern Europe or Reformation or Renaissance Europe, that, well, that's you can, how it worked. You can also look at the history of feminism. Yeah, uh, uh, Helen Lewis has just written a great book called Difficult Women. And she gives all these examples. So it's, it's just one I think actually even so some people on the left or people who are considering themselves progressives may not like Helen Lewis and think, oh, she's a centrist or whatever. But it's actually a really great book. If you especially read the chapter on how women got the right to vote in Great Britain, she I think she really uh, has this great description of how the coalition came together. And this is also a very important message, I think, for the left, is that sometimes you have to make uncomfortable compromises and build uncomfortable coalitions because... 
I mean, you can sort of try and, and, and be right all your life, sort of in the margins. But at some point, you actually want to change some things, right? You actually want to achieve something and maybe win an election for once. So uh, I think that's a really great example of how sort of a whole movement that was considered as nasty and difficult and unreasonable uh, succeeded in changing uh, Britain. We'll come back to the elections in a second. Um, this claim, it's a big claim you make in the book, and I don't know how evidenced it is in neuroscience and sort of evolutionary psychology and so on, but what you're, what you're essentially saying is, what is so special about Homo sapiens? You know, there were, there were sort of predecessor hominids, you have Homo erectus, mm -hmm. uh, you have Neanderthals, you have all mm -hmm. these other sort of, you know, hominids existed actually alongside us. Mm -hmm. Now there's... 7.8 billion of us today there's none of those guys and it's not because we were smarter it's not because we were quicker or stronger actually anything but but mm -hmm. simply because we were more cooperative and and more friendly have i got that right is that one of the principal claims in the book yeah that's basically it uh, there's even a term for this now in biology uh, scientists call it self-domestication theory so the idea here is that we've done something to ourselves that we have also later done to other animals right so we've got pigs and we've got cows and got sheep and they've all been domesticated right which means that for centuries or for millennia even we sort of selected the the friendlier sheep and the friendlier or the tamer sheep and um so domestication is all about uh, sort of you start with a wolf and you end up with a chihuahua right and the same process has actually taken place in our evolutionary history and uh, there's something called domestication sy syndrome this is just a, a list of traits that domesticated uh, species have so, for example, they have thinner bones, they have smaller brains, and most importantly, they just look a bit more childish, right? A bit more pedomorphic, it's the scientific term. And then if you look at our evolution, this is exactly what you see. So you dig up skeletons from 50,000 years ago or 40, 30, 20,000, 10,000 years ago, and you see this process, right? You see the rise of what I like to call homo puppy, right? We have sort of become puppyish. In, in our evolution. And this is actually our true superpower because friendly people are just better at cooperating. Um, they're not, uh, individually, they're not that special, right? Human beings are not that smart. We're not that powerful either on an individual level, but collectively we can do things that other species just can't. And we can learn so much from each other and then build highly complex cultures. And I think this is the reason why we built pyramids and spaceships while the Neanderthals uh, they're gone. Yeah. As a Marxist, I like the idea that the only thing that sort of delimits us from other hominids is, is our faculty for cooperation. Uh, another big claim you make in the book, uh, we're going to get a quote up here. This is from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, mm -hmm. uh, Discourse, Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, one of my favourite quotes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's great prose, but you also think it's got an element of truth, or more than an element. The yeah. first man who, having fenced in a piece of land, said, this is mine, and found people naive enough to believe him, that man was the true founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortunes might not have, might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware of listening to this imposter. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself belongs to nobody. Uh, fantastic prose. I believe no, that, that won a writing, isn't it? <laughs> that won a prize, right? Am I, yeah, am I wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It won a prize. You won first prize in a big essay. Called yeah. And that was like his breakthrough. Uh, that was his, uh, his breakthrough thing. So your yeah. contention is that alongside a great piece of, you know, uh, enlightenment writing, mm -hmm. uh, giddy prose, optimistic mm -hmm. prose, well, not optimistic, but uh, almost utopian in, in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, in terms of where we came from our sort of prehistoric mm -hmm. origins. Your contention in the book, or one of the contentions in the book, is that looking at sort of archaeology, ancient history, actually, it turns out the best empirical evidence suggests this is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rousseau has often been described as this naive romantic, right? This idealistic French guy who was a good writer, but, you know, was not very realistic and scientific. And people have often said that actually Thomas Hobbes, you know, who's often put in opposition to him, the British philosopher, uh, philosopher had a much more realistic view of human nature. So Thomas Hobbes believed that when we were still nomadic hunter gatherers, there was some kind of war of all against all going on, right? And he famously said that in the state of nature, we lived lives that were nasty, brutish, and short. Now, Rousseau said pretty much the opposite. He said, actually, the state of nature was pretty good. You know, then we had lives that were quite healthy and egalitarian, and we had freedom. 
Uh, but then civilization came and civilization was the real disaster, right? That's what we should never have done. And for a long time, I believe that actually Hobbes was right. I, I had read, for example, the book of Steven Pinker, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And I thought, yeah, I mean, this is pretty convincing, you know, all the empirical evidence of hunter-gatherers being so violent and living these unhealthy lives. Um, but then I started going deeper in the academic research and you find actually a very different picture, pretty much the opposite, is that most specialists, most archaeologists and anthropologists um, sort of, well, basically they agree with Rousseau, right? So it's, it seems that he was more or less right. We now know that nomadic and togatherers um, lived and sometimes still live lives uh, in relatively egalitarian societies. You could call them proto-feminists. They're also quite healthy compared to farmers and city dwellers. They haven't got all these infection diseases, for example, like malaria and polio and uh, corona. I mean, it's a, also a, civ a disease of civilization. Um, and when you look at sort of how violent they were, well, the evidence of, of someone like Steven Pinker is just very thin, actually. Uh, he, I think, makes a lot of basic mistakes in his book. Uh, if you really focus on nomadic hunter-gatherers, then you find that they are quite peaceful. And if you look at the archaeology of, um, of violence and you go far enough, uh, deep enough in history, right? Uh, so you really look at like what happened uh, more than 10,000 years ago. There's almost no evidence for warfare. You know, one of my favorite examples here is uh, cave paintings. If there was really some kind of war of all against all going on in our deep history, then you would expect that at some point, some artist, you know, from the Stone Age would have said, you know what, I'm going to make a nice painting of, a, you know, this bloody war. <laughs> um, I'm going to make that today, but we haven't found it. But then after we settled down and after we became farmers, you suddenly do find a lot of these cave paintings, right? So the evidence we have suggests that actually uh, inventing civilization, this was the big moment. This was the big transition. And um, for the most part, it was a terrible, terrible decision. So, yeah, Rousseau was right. So, I mean, because, uh, you know, you're a, you're a well-educated uh, sort of European social democrat. You know, I have these. But it sounds to me like you, you're you an anarcho-primitivist. <laughs> because, I, yeah, you know, the, it, it, is, it, is it a fair depiction of your view then to say that you think, you know, 12,000 years ago, uh, with the Neolithic Revolution, with agriculture, mm -hmm. with, with formal agriculture, as we kind of now have it with cereals and so on. Mm -hmm. Was that a mistake? Should we, you know, if we had our time back, should we have not done that? Hmm. Well, maybe it's a bit too early to say, I guess. Uh, I mean, uh, we've obviously made a huge amount of progress in the last couple of decades, right? Technological progress. I think also uh, some moral progress when you think about human rights or, you know, people having the right to vote, for example. The question is just how sustainable is it? We don't know that yet. If you look at things like climate change or the extinction of species and you realize, you know, we have to be quick, right? We have to scale up so many of the solutions. Um, and I think that's really the only way forward. I mean, I'm not arguing that we can go backward back and live as hunter-gatherers again. But what I do say is that when we design our institutions, for example, our schools, our prisons, our democracies, our workplaces, then it's very important to actually know who we are and where we come from, right? It's very important to have a realistic view of human nature. And this is also something that I urge progressives and people on the left to do. You know, people on the left have often been a bit wary about discussions uh, uh, about human nature, right? They, I think they basically are uh, have for a long time, been a little bit afraid that sort of the evidence would point them in a very dark direction, right? Sort of in the in the direction of us being killer apes or like, like being deeply violent. And often also uh, the idea has been popular that we are just blank slates and you can basically do whatever you want as long as you have the right policies and institutions. I think that's really wrong. Human beings do have a nature and it's mostly egalitarian and cooperative. Uh, there are some real dangers in our nature as well, right? Our, our capacity for groupthink, our tribal behavior, uh, the fact that power corrupts. And these are all things that hunter-gatherers were aware of and had solutions for. For example, the power of shame is really important here. Um, we are the only species in the animal kingdom, apart from some parrots, that can actually blush. I mean, it's a stunning fact about who we are as a species, is that this is really sort of designed within our body that we involuntarily give away our feelings at the moment we feel shame which is so important for the functioning of our societies and also i mean one of the terrible facts of politics today right is that so many of our politicians i mean it seems they can't really feel shame right they've been so corrupted by power um 
but yeah, so the major point here is that, um, yeah, we need to take this seri seriously. We really need to think hard about what our nature actually is, because then we can design our societies around that idea. Yeah, I had a great conversation with um, uh, a sort of acolyte of Andres Malm in Sweden, mm -hmm. uh, and, and he was an anarcho-primitivist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, but he was trying to apply it to, to, the, to, to the sort of modern day. Uh, he wasn't. He wasn't like Army of the Twelve Monkeys and Brad Pitt, and you know, let's destroy everything. But he he had, he was profoundly. He had a profound pessimism around technological change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so very, very quickly, you, you don't think that's uh, the way to, to go. So I, I presume you would want a greater degree of localism. You, I mean, because mm -hmm. clearly, pol I agree with you, a politician in a polity of 100 million people is going to be less inclined to feeling shame than a politician in a polity of 50,000 people because you all know one another. Is, is that a practical way of understanding uh, this kind of historical observation, which other otherwise might just seem quite abstract? Hmm. I think it's just incredibly important to remember that power corrupts. I mean, there are a few findings within psychology that we have more evidence for, right? There's even some evidence now from neur neurology. Uh, you know, these scientists that have put powerful people in a brain scanner. And oh, wow. like, it seems as if they have like literal brain damage, right? In the sense that, for example, the regions in their brain that are all about feeling empathy don't work as well anymore. Or the regions in their brain that are all about mirroring other people, you know, people mirror each other all the time. Right, we Im imitate each other, which is really a, an important reason for our success. You know, it helps us to cooperate. But then these regions in the brain don't really work with powerful people. Um, it seems as if they've become a little bit sort of disconnected from from sort of the network, from the Wi-Fi. Right, they're not plugged in anymore. Um, and nomadic and togetherers, as I said, already knew this, and so they use the power of shame and group pressure and um, uh, sort of the importance of humility for them was was is, is really striking if you look at this uh, the scientists who actually lived uh, with these kind of uh, societies. Um, so when we design our democracies, um, yeah, it's all about uh, sort of distributing power as much as you can. Uh, I think also about empower empowering citizens. So this whole idea that I don't know you have an election once every two, three, four years, sort of a I, I think it's sort of an elective aristocracy, right? The only freedom that we have is sort of to choose our own mm. aristocrats. Yeah. Um, it's not a that's not a genuine democracy, right? And there are alternative models like deliberative democracy, participatory democracy, participatory budgeting. And there are lots of examples around the globe of of cities and governments that have already quite successfully experimented with this. Um, the only problem here is that often the press absolutely hates it because these experiments are quite boring to look at. Right, you just have really sensible people having rational discussions about controversial uh, topics, right? And it's not it's not really good entertainment. It's not good for ratings. I think this is the biggest problem with participatory democracy. Uh, let's turn to the Blitz, which is pr pr probably quite interesting for a British audience, but I, I guess in a, in a context of coronavirus, which we may turn to um, with this question, really. Uh, mm -hmm. So what, what you say in the book is that actually, um, before the sort of German bombing campaign of Britain starts 1940, after mm -hmm. the phony war ends effectively, um, leading sort of British politicians, generals anticipated that the, the public would actually respond in a far more negative way than they ultimately did. Churchill predicted that three or four million people would leave London. Yeah. Politically, any kind of mass bombing campaign on, on big urban areas would make the situation politically unmanageable. We, we know that didn't happen. The complete opposite happened. Um, and the contention you make in the book is that actually this wasn't the blitz spirit in so much as this was an outgrowth of the British or the English character. Mm -hmm. This was an expression of, of human nature. So can you, can you talk about some of the findings you found with the blitz? Uh, and how it, it confounded the expectations of, of politicians and perhaps how that applies more broadly now to a world of coronavirus and lockdowns and um, all these mm -hmm. limits on our freedoms, which actually have seen us respond with incredible levels of cooperation. Yeah. So throughout history, so many elites have bought into this so-called veneer theory of civilization. And so their argument is that civilization is only a thin veneer and that as soon as something happens, you know, when the bombs start falling, when uh, there's a flooding, there's an earthquake, a tsunami or a pandemic or something like that, that people just go nuts, that they panic, that they become very selfish. They become animals, monsters. They start looting. They start plundering. So this is a very old idea. And it pops up again and again and again, uh, especially in Western history. 
Um, so indeed, this was uh, also the case uh, on the eve of the Second World War, is that the British elite was really afraid that the British population um, couldn't handle it, that their sort of their spirit, their will would, would be broken uh, very quickly and then that they could never win the war. Um, then obviously the bombs started falling and pretty much the opposite happened. So there was this explosion of altruism and cooperation. And, uh, you know, we've got these wonderful eyewitness accounts of, you know, people uh, sort of drinking their tea while uh, the bombs were falling. And American journalists sort of, they, they were really astonished to, to see what they, uh, what they saw. Um, and so this was called sort of the blitz spirit. And it was explained by the elites at the time um, in a way to say, well, uh, this is so extraordinary about British culture, right? This is what makes us special as a nation. Then in 1942, they had to decide what they would do with their Air Force. And uh, the question was obviously, what are they going to bomb in Germany? Is it, is it going to be infrastructure, like industry or, or, or railroads? Or are, they, are we going to bomb cities you know, to try and break the spirit of the people? Now, the experts said, uh, you know, I think uh, we can actually break the spirit of the Germans because they have this very weak moral character. You know, they're not as special as we are. So that's what they tried. And again, pretty much the opposite happened. We've got evidence from a group of British economists who toured Germany after the war and actually discovered that the cities that, you know, had been uh, bombed the heaviest saw increased wartime production compared to those cities who who were not bombed as heavy. It's just this fascinating... Uh, thing and 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 people just keep making that mistake over and over again or elites do it you also saw it after um katrina so rebecca solnit the american author has written a fantastic book about this is that uh, people thought that uh uh or many journalists desc the, describe the situation as that people would go nuts you know start looting start plundering etc etc uh but then the sociologist came in a couple of months later and actually found that again you, you know you got this explosion of altruism and cooperation. Now we have actually more than 700 case studies of earthquakes and tsunamis uh, studied since the 1960s. And um, yeah, sociologists even talk about the disaster myth that pops up again and again in the media. And sort of the disaster myth is that people panic and become violent and start plundering and looting after something like that. It's not the case. I'm going to uh, put on the live, by the way, because someone's saying that it's too dark here. If you have one minute. I think you look okay, but go for it. Uh, that's probably a good opportune moment for me to say you're watching Navarro Media. I'm interviewing Rutger Bregman on his new book, Humankind. Uh, hit the like button. That's absolutely right. I think we've got 13. <laughs> better, right? <laughs> we've got, let me have a look. Uh, let's have a look. Bring back in Rutger. I actually preferred you before, but it doesn't matter. Oh. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I, it was quite atmospheric. Um, maybe people can get in the comments and say what they preferred. Yeah, uh, we've got. Uh, you, you, There's a great connection. It's a great conversation, regardless. We've got 1,300 people watching. We've only got 330 likes smash the like button um <laughs> we're halfway through the show we'll go to questions at the end please put your questions with a rocket emoji um so anybody who's been watching this so far will say this guy has a really uh, you wouldn't call yourself an optimist you'd say i'm an empiricist mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but by the sort of prevailing common sense you have a you know an optimistic kind of set of conclusions about human nature and mm -hmm. you think that a pessimism around human nature serves a particular political purpose now what i like about this book and we've had some people in the comments saying oh um because you mentioned stephen pinker and say oh lol he's mentioning stephen pinker and actually it's to criticize it what i love about this book and i think it's a really it's a great genre of of social commentary is to kind of line up a bunch of arguments that you would just want to take down, which is, which is kind of what you do. Lord of the Flies, the Blitz Spirit, mm -hmm. uh, uh, several of them. But I think you do. I think the, the sort of high point in the book is when you get these two, and everybody's going to know about these experiments. Uh, it's the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment, which was about domination and power. And these were huge seminal social psychology experiments, which come out of the late 1960s we've got mm. two videos just so our audience are familiar with this and the first one is the stanford prison test let's watch that now the prisoners rebelled they barricaded themselves in their cells and said we refused to come out they took off their numbers they didn't want to be de-individuated they started cursing the guards to their face and the key the key turning point was the guards began to think of them as dangerous prisoners and so the guards formulated a plan, used fire extinguishers, took the doors down, dragged the prisoners out, stripped them naked, and essentially broke the rebellion in a purely physical way. 
From that point on, the study was as remarkable a series of events as I've ever seen. It was, it was a real laboratory for Zimbardo and I to watch human nature transformed in a very rapid way uh, in the face of a very powerful situation. Um, now, you think, or you, not you think, your, your claim is that that experiment was, was kind of bullshit. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure many people, you know, that's the sort of thing I think, that's the kind of thing my dad would have watched on Discovery Channel. And it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, so wh why was that experiment bullshit? Well, you know, I used to believe this as well. You know, I've used this ex example, this experiment in, in, in some earlier books I've written. And um, so it was pretty astonishing for me to find out that actually the archives have opened up. And there's this great French sociologist called Thibault Letexier. He's written a book about the experiment. It's called The History of a Lie. Uh, it's not been translated in English. Uh, if, if there's any publisher watching, I mean, translated already. Uh, and what he basically showed is... It's a hoax. It's really a hoax. Uh, so what Zimbardo, who's now basically the most famous living psychologist alive, um, what he did, he specifically instructed the students, you know, the guard students, to be as sadistic as possible, you know, on day one of the experiment. Now, many of those students said, no, I don't want to do that. It's not who I am. You know, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a hippie. I'm a pacifist. I'm not going to be a sadistic, a sadistic monster. Then Simbardo and his colleagues said, no, 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 you got to do this because we need this for the experiment. We need these results because then we can go to the press and say, look, prisons are horrible environments. We need to reform the whole prison system here in the USA. And that's what you want, right? You're a liberal hippie. Come on, help me with this. We need these results. And then some of the guards, uh, actually a minority, but some of them went along with the ex experiment with the whole theater. And just a couple of days after the experiment was canceled, it was like after six days or something like that was canceled, uh, Simbardo immediately went to the press. And this became the most famous experiment in all psychology. You know, up until this day, it's still in all the textbooks of, of so many first year psychology students. And it again and again, it, it sort of gives people this dark message about human nature. It's basically another version of veneer theory, right? Look, here you have these very healthy, pacifistic students and you put them in a in an evil situation and very quickly the devil comes out in each and every one of them. No, 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 it's absolutely not what happened. They were trying to help. They were being misled by, by this researcher who became very famous because of it. So we're going to go to uh, another experiment, uh, mm -hmm. a very similar experiment. Mm -hmm. And this is the Milgram experiment. Again, it's something your, your, your mum and dad, your grandparents probably saw on the Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to that video now. Can you please, teacher? Well, I tell them we're going over it again. No, just, just go ahead. Blue, boy, girl, grass, hat. Correct. Nice. Day, sky, job, chair. Wrong. Answer is day. 285 volts. Continue, please. Fat. Man, lady, tub, neck. Answer, please. Wrong. Answer is neck. 300 volts. Absolutely refuse to answer anymore. Get me out of here. You can't hardly here. Get me out. Get me out of here. Continue. The next word is green, please. Green, grass, hat, ink, apple. So I'm going to briefly explain the milligram experiment. Um, mm -hmm. This, the premise is very similar to the Stanford Prisoner Experiment. Maybe you, we, we could recapitulate that, but effectively what that was was a bunch of people got to be the prison prisoners arbitrarily, mm -hmm. a bunch of people got to be the guards, and they filled those roles. They filled the social yeah. expectations of, of the function they were fulfilling. Mm -hmm. With the Milgram experiment, this was about deferring to authority. And so you were told to go in somewhere, it was fine. The guy with the white, quote, white coat was the authority figure, and you had to basically do as you were told. And it turns out that lots of people were willing to subject other individuals to excessive amounts of pain. You know, they're saying, please let me out. 
uh, but they were, would carry on because they were told to do so. And this was used as a, an example of how fascism happened. And it was about, you know, yeah. and what you call veneer theory and how the, the Nazi is just underneath the surface with all of us. Uh, but just like the Stanford prisoner experiment, you, you, you call you call bullshit on this. Why is yeah. that? I wouldn't call it a hoax like the Stanford prison experiment. I think there's still real value in the Milgram experiments. And we should also note here that they've actually been replicated in different countries by different researchers with more or less similar results. But I think there are a lot of problems in here as well. So there's an Australian psychologist called Gina Perry who's written this fantastic book. And she also has gone into the archives of this experiment and actually discovered that, you know, Milgram put a lot of pressure on a subject. He often, you know, didn't follow the research protocol. Um, and most importantly, many of the subjects didn't believe the shocks were real. You know, they sort of thought, well, this is probably fake. And if they believe that, that the shocks were fake, they would go further, right? They would give higher shocks, which makes sense. I mean, if you don't think they're mm. real anyway, then you can, you know, give give bigger shocks to, to an innocent people uh, in the other room. Um, now, Milgram knew all of this. But he didn't really talk about it, right? He didn't really report it. We know now from his private diaries that he said things like uh, that he wasn't sure whether it was good science or theater. Uh, and that's really the question that still hangs over the Milgram experiment. I must say, when I was writing this book, at first I thought, you know, this is just a, another hoax, you know, uh, just another version of veneer theory. Uh, I changed my mind about that. I still think there there's some value in there because... You would expect that only like psychopath or really sort of crazy people that, you know, there's something wrong with them would sort of be willing to give really dangerous shocks to an innocent people in another room. Mm. But, and so maybe it's not 65% that Milgram said. Maybe it's like 50 or 40 or 30 or 20% or something like that. Maybe it's lower, but it's still way too high, right? So I think there's still real value if you uh, study the experiment. If you, for example, want to understand how... Uh, sort of evil penetrates society, right? It doesn't go from zero volts to 450 volts. Now it goes from zero to 15, from 50 to 30, from 30 to 45, right? So mm -hmm. evil becomes normalized over time. And that's, that is, I think, an incredibly important insight that Milgram had. Um, one other thing that it's really important to say here is that Milgram sort of thought that, or described his subjects as sort of these robotic people who were just doing as they were told, right? just following orders, as many Germans said after the war. A new generation of psychologists actually believe there's something else going on here, is that these subjects just want to be good subjects, right? They identify with the scientists and they want to help the scientists, right? Mm -hmm. They want to help science forward. And so they're being misled in that way. And this is another, I think, uh, sort of dark truth about humanity is that we often do the most horrible things in the name of the good, right? Uh, in the name of loyalty, of friendship, of comradeship. And this is a theme that I come back to again and again in, in my book, is that there's a really dark side to our capacity for friendliness as well. Yeah, I thought that was such a fantastic explanation for it. You know, the uh, how do you explain war if humans are so cooperative? And you say, well, we're just incredibly cooperative with people who look and sound like us. You know, it's really, mm. uh, and we um, there's, a, there's a hierarchy going on there. Um, there is a big piece of evidence, though, a huge piece of evidence, which kind of which kind of backs up a lot of your assertions here. We're saying that human beings are generally good. They generally don't want to hurt others. They generally, you know, they're eager to please. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you look at quite a bit of data over a sort of the modern period with regards to warfare. And, and in, in quite a few different theatres of war, you work out that somewhere between 20, 25 percent of combatants in warfare are actually fighting. Um, often people aren't really shooting at one another or they're making an active effort not to be involved or they're shooting over the heads of other mm -hmm. people. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so this is a very famous observation by an American historian uh, and a military man called SLA Marshall. It's quite controversial as well. So what he said and what he observed uh, during the Second World War as he sort of was allowed to go along with the troops and interview them immediately after they had fought is that only 15 to 25% of the soldiers had actually managed to fire their guns, that the vast majority couldn't do it, that something was holding them back. Um, so he wrote a book about this, Men Against Fire, that became very influential in the American military uh, because sort of the American military was like, okay, we got to do something about this, right? We got to train our soldiers to actually be able to fire at the enemy. So uh, they did this with boot camps and conditioning 
uh, and, and all kinds of psychological tricks. So that actually worked. We know that, for example, during the Vietnam War, the firing rate went up uh, to 90, 95%. But uh, you pay a price for that. So when people actually kill in wars, when just sort of average drafted soldiers kill in wars, uh, they often kill something within themselves as well, right? So many people came back from Vietnam with PTSD, which suggests to me that we're not born to kill, right? I mean, we like sex, we like food, but then if you kill someone else in a war, you destroy something within yourself as well, right? That sort of suggests to me that this is not a sort of our evolutionary destiny. Now, obviously, this sounds very uh, counterintuitive, right? It goes uh, against a lot of historical scholarship. It goes against everything that Hollywood has taught us and is still teaching us today about violence and how supposedly how easy it is. But actually, SLA Marshall's findings, even though they have been controversial, right? He was not a great statistician. He was more of like an intuitive thinker. Um, but it has been backed up since then uh, by historical uh, uh, research and also by sociological uh, research. So one uh, of the great thinkers here is a sociologist named Randall Collins, who wrote this book called uh, Violence that I can recommend to everyone, where he sort of d d uh, makes the point that violence is actually really hard. We've been, we've been so brainwashed by watching, I don't know, too much Netflix and Hollywood movies that give us the impression that violence is easy, right? That, I don't know, if, uh, if someone accidentally hits someone in a bar and then someone falls over and then uh, there's so, very soon a war of all, against all going on, right? That is, the, that is this contagious thing. No, 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 that's, not, that's really not how violence works. Uh, we are capable of it, obviously we are, uh, but we find it quite hard, especially when someone is close to us. So if you look at the, the history of military technology, you see really this evolution where enemies uh, are just farther and farther away. So psychologically, it's really hard to show the sword on someone or use a bayonet. You know, most bayonets throughout history have not been used, actually, which is, a, for me, that was really a fascinating and striking finding. Um, but uh, it's much easier to shoot a gun or it's even easier to use artillery, right? To just push a button and kill someone far away or drop an atomic bomb on a, on a Japanese city, right? And people don't feel any remorse here. So I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything here. We're obviously capable of the most horrific violence, um, but we, yeah, we need to increase the distance here between, uh, between us and other people so that we can actually do it. It's not something that comes natural. What does it say to us then about the sort of the the future of warfare? Is obviously we've already seen drones play an increasingly prominent role in in conflicts over the last fifteen years. Yeah. Um, yeah. If the future of war is automation, I mean, that increasingly would mean that you will see inhumane things uh, inflicted onto onto people in in conflict zones. So, what does that tell us about the ethics of warfare? Does that mean we should refrain from using drones and? robot soldiers and so on that we should you know uh, it, it, it does that make conflict too easy does it you know hmm. it, does it mean the cost of entry is so low that all of a sudden actually what would otherwise be quite rational to refrain from a conflict we now enter it instead are there any practical yeah. sort of implications of this well <laughs> i i would just say well don't start a war anyway right if you look at the history of western interventions since the second world war they've pretty much all been a favor failure right so uh I'm skeptical about intervention anyway. Because uh, I think one of the sort of big growth areas in the, you know, you talk about growth, I think maybe even you talk about it in your last book, you talk about mm -hmm. there's not many growth areas in terms of jobs. One is, you know, ethicists, whether, whether it's artificial intelligence or synthetic biology. But mm -hmm. I do think, you know, ethicists looking at the realm of technology and military uh, warfare, I think it's a huge mm -hmm. area. Now, all of a sudden, if, if we start intervening in, in, in foreign countries and it's being entirely overseen by machines and mm. you know, British service personnel aren't being risked, but thousands of people are dying. I mean, I, I, I find that, you know, abominable. Uh, and I yeah, think it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well, it's the same with the animal, animal industry, right? So if people would see a video of the bacon that they're going to eat, you know, in the morning or the steak or whatever, most of us couldn't eat it anymore. We couldn't do it because it's just too horrible to watch. But still, we consume more and more meat every year, right? Because we have this whole industry that makes sure that all that happens far away, you know, at a distance from us. So you could easily, I mean, Yuval Noah Harari, the historian, has made this point that sort of the meat industry is probably the biggest crime in all of human history. You know, if you just look at the skill of it, right, we are killing sentient beings on, a, on just a, 
it's just difficult to wrap your head around it. Uh, and how, how can we do it? Well, only with all these sort of technological innovations uh, that make us make it possible so that we sort of don't have to face the, uh, the psychological consequences of this horrific thing. Alienation, you might even say. Yeah. We're so alienated from what we're eating. So uh, yeah. very quickly, because I want to move on to a, qu a question about prisons, but does that mean you, you're advising all of our audience this evening to go vegan and all the people listening on podcasts? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm personally, I'm a vegetarian trying to become vegan, but I was, I mean, I'm, I'm a Dutch guy. I was, I was sort of, when I was young, I fell into a kettle of cheese. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's difficult, but I have a huge respect for vegans and, uh, I, yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to become one myself. That's good. Uh, we've got, well, I had a video actually, Gary, who's producing the show tonight, give Gary a shout in the comments. He's a <laughs> vegan as well. Gary. He's, been doing, he's been doing it for a long time. Um, Prisons are a complete waste of time in Britain and the United States. Is that is that a fair conclusion? And, and that they should more uh, closely resemble what's going on in Norway if they're serious about cutting reoffending rates and saving the taxpayer money. Yeah. So when you look at the traditional prison, it's basically a taxpayer funded institution to educate people for more criminal behavior. Right. This is you really see this in the US. People come in for small drug offenses and they, they come out as hardened criminals. And it's really expensive as well, right? So it's this, this crazy situation. Now, can you turn that around? Yes, you can. But then you have to have prisons that don't look like prisons at all. So in the book, I give, give the example of Norwegian prisons. Uh, one of my favorite examples here is Bastoy, which is an island, sort of like a pacifistic utopian community, uh, a little bit to the south of Oslo, where people who have done quite horrible things, right? Murderers, rapists, you know, violent people um, are given the freedom to live their own lives. You know, the only thing they can't, they can't get away, they're a prison, uh, but they can go to the cinema. They can, you know, they, they barbecue together with the guards. They uh, have a music studio. There's, there's uh, even their own music label, which is called Criminal Records. Uh, two of the inmates have already participated in Norwegian Idols. Um, it's it's very very counterintuitive. If you look at it, you're like, oh, these these Norwegians have gone nuts. But then you look at two things. Well, you look at the reoffending rate, and it's the lowest in the world, the recidivism rate. So the chances that someone will commit another crime once he or she gets out of prison, it's nowhere as low as in Norway. Uh, while it's very high in sort of traditional prison systems like in the UK and the US. Um, and then you look at the economics behind it, and you discover this actually saves money. So the traditional prison is really expensive and it educates people for more criminal behavior. But then you look at these Norwegian prisons and you discover that actually um, because people come in as criminals and they go out as citizens, you know, they, they, the, the chance that they will get a job, for example, goes up by 40% and they become tax paying uh, entrepreneurs, citizens, whatever. Um, so it's a much more rational way of organizing a prison like that. But you really have to go against your intuition, right? It's uh, uh, it's it's really all about assuming the best, not only in your friends and those close to you, but also in those who are far away from you, even people who have done quite horrible things. Let's stick to criminal justice for a second. You say that the the theory of you know the broken windows theory, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm sure many people in the UK will have heard about that. The sort of Bill mm -hmm. Bratton. Uh, school of policing. Maybe you can talk about what that is very briefly. You say that that doesn't work. So can you explain the broken windows theory and, and why it doesn't work? Yeah. Well, the initial idea was quite nice. The idea was that if you have a neighborhood that's really messy with a lot of, uh, I don't know, gravity, is that what you call it in English? Uh, and a lot of broken windows, basically, then you just have to clean the whole thing up and people will feel safer. So sort of um, big crimes can start with sort of small nuisances. Uh, but then the theory was expanded into the idea that you also have to sort of persecute people who commit very small crimes very hard. So, for example, people who parked in the wrong spot or are uh, trespassing or uh, something like that or are, are drinking alcohol in public. Um, and that's really what happened, especially in the United States. This, this philosophy became really popular. The idea that if you want to combat sort of the, uh, do something about the really terrible crime, like the homicides and the murders, then you have to start with the small things first. Um, and, and then I realized that this is basically another version of veneer theory again. You know, it's again the idea that, um, you know, 
in, a, in each and every one of us, there's just this uh, criminal just below the surface. And what happened is that it also became an excuse for racism, right? Because uh, very quickly, all these sort of small demeanors and small crimes, well, it was basically, uh, uh, it ended up in a lot of ethnic profiling. And um, the relationship between the police and the community was really destroyed. Um, so it, it has, has, has really been a disaster, I think. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to fix broken windows. Obviously, it's great. But uh, it's not good to sort of assume the worst in every citizen, right? And that's basically what broken windows theory ended up uh, being. Everybody's sort of one minute away from being a, a criminal. Um, towards the end of the book, you talk about how people should behave. Uh, this is a book about sort of human nature and ethics, and, and you offer some some proposals. Um, uh, and one of them is about uh, avoiding the news, mm -hmm. which is strange given that you're a journalist. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I want I want to, to sort of hear your views on this to clarify it for our audience. You're telling people that the news is bad for them. If you could just mm -hmm. explain why it's bad for them. And given you yourself are obviously quite well informed, how, how do you stay informed while also mm -hmm. not engaging with the news? Yeah. Well, let's first make a distinction between the news and journalism, right? There's a lot of journalism that helps us to understand the world in a better way that helps us to zoom out and understand the structural forces that really govern our lives. Um, but the news is more about sort of the sensationalist incidental stuff that, and it's mostly negative as well. Um, and if you follow a lot, of, a lot of the news, you'll become more cynical. You'll become more depressed. There's even a term for this within psychology. Uh, so scientists call it mean world syndrome. And um, yeah, I think that it's sort of, makes you more cynical, it doesn't give you hope, and so it also doesn't impel you to act. It's it's basically not good for you. It's like a drug with all kinds of nasty side effects. Six o'clock news, should I watch it? Oh, sorry, I missed that. Six o'clock news, should I watch it? No, no, no. Broadcast news. Um, no, I think uh, you can miss all of that. So no TV news? No, I mean... Uh, for me, TV is too slow anyway. I mean, I always, <laughs> documentaries, I watch it like 1.5 speed or something like that, but that's another subject. Um, daily, no, news, I mean, daily newspapers? Uh, if you read a newspaper, then read the Saturday newspaper or read right. the Sunday newspaper and start at the back, right? And not at the beginning. I mean, if you think about the product of what a newspaper is, it's very strange, actually. People don't want to read a newspaper that is a day old because they think, you know, I, I'm not going to read the news of yesterday. But then how worthless must the information be in that newspaper if it's only one day old and you don't want to read it anymore? And then it must be so true. So the, the reality, of, of course, is that most news is not about sort of educating ourselves to become more informed citizens. No, most news is just like sugar, right? It's just entertainment. And we sort of follow it because we're addicted to it. And I mean, can understand that. And sometimes I can't resist as well. But yeah, it's sort of important to, to keep in mind that it's not an innocent thing and it has real effects on how you look at the world. Uh, quick sort of quick sort of um, uh, riff on that. Do, do, do you think that the, the media age we live in, the saturation of news, constant kind of updates, push notifications, Twitter, et cetera, do you think that is inhibiting and obstructing people from actually building political alternatives? So in the 1930s, people built an alternative. You have the New Deal, you have welfareism in Europe. Do, do you think that Twitter and social media is acting as a kind of backstop on, and stopping that from happening this time around? Do we all need to get off Twitter? Yeah, maybe. I do think that people, including myself, spent way too much time on Twitter, right? Um, and that, it, I mean, we talked earlier in our conversation about the importance of building coalitions. And I think that people on the left have become really bad at this is that they, they find it so important to, or they sort of find it very hard that someone who's sort of broadly on their side has just this one difference of opinion or is quoting the wrong person, right? Oh, he's quoting Steven Pinker. He's quoting Helen Lewis. I don't trust him anymore, right? Um, if, if you're really like that, if you really want to be so pure, then at some point, you know, you'll, you'll be very lonely. And I think this is a genuine problem with people on the left, with progressives. It's, it's, Freud, Freud called it the narcissism of minor differences, right? And I've experienced this quite often, right? The people who seem to hate me the most actually agree with me on most things, right? <laughs> so um, it's mostly sort of left academics who seem to hate me the most. Well, yeah, sort of my feeling is that um, I'm obviously, I have a different job, right? So I, in my work, I try to make a, 
synthesis of lots of different ideas and and uh, and different fields. And I obviously talk to a broad audience as well, so I can't write in an academic jargon. You know, I need to uh, make sure that my my mother understands what's going on here as well. But that's an important role to play, just as. Uh, it's important that we have activists who are being dragged away by the riot police. You know, I'm not the kind of person who does that. You know, I'm just a sissy. I, I'm, but I really admire the people who do that. And they all play a role in this movement, right? And I think that so often progressives, and, and, and maybe this is true about modern progressives, and maybe it's because of the, we live in this Twitter age, but we've become really bad at building coalitions. Uh, and that's we really need to learn how to do that because that's the only way to actually yeah uh grab power and change something in our societies so the most sort of the most i won't call it controversial but it's gotten a lot of attention we've had some of it in the comments um one of the points i think it's it's towards the end of your sort of commandments to go not commandments mm -hmm. bits of advice towards the end of the book uh, and you say don't punch nazis mm -hmm. uh and just uh just to just to be clear we have uh producer gary actually made a a punch pepe badge but you know <laughs> That, that you know we we we're, we're, we're the home of the, we're the home of the left. We try you know we try mm. to encompass all views on the left. Don't punch Nazis, and obviously that's kind of um, a response to what became a kind of um, a humorous um, take on anti-fascism, anti-sort of fascist activism. Yeah. Straight up, Trump punch not punch Nazi. Yeah, uh, and you're saying don't punch Nazis, uh, and I want to know where where you are in the kind of grey area in between, which mm -hmm. is kind of most traditional anti-fascist activism in the post-war period in this country anyway uh, and one example of this was in 2013 i believe when the edl the english defense league about five thousand people on the far right wants to march through a primarily muslim area tower hamlets mm -hmm. and um the local community didn't want them to come through because they know they'd smash up shops whatever mm -hmm. which they, they had done previously uh and so they were going to physically stop them from coming through where would you stand on something like that? Because it's not actively seeking to to knock somebody out. Mm -hmm. It's merely saying somebody like you with your views is not welcome in our community. Yeah. Where, I think where, that's where... great. And I think that's very brave as well. Uh, and I think it's just the example uh, that we've seen throughout history of the most successful movements that managed to topple authoritarian dictatorships, for example, have been the peaceful movements. There's this political scientist called Erica Chenoweth, who's built this huge database of movements that try to topple dictatorships um, since the 1900s. And she found that on average, the peaceful movements are, I don't know, two, three times more effective than the violent movements. So I think just, just to, uh, like you shouldn't bomb terrorists because then terrorists, you know, can recruit more terrorists. That, that's also the reason why you shouldn't punch Nazis. And uh, in the book, I give another example of what you can actually do. So this this German town called One Seedle, um, that has has this uh, march of Nazis through the town every year because some I don't know some influential Nazi was buried there. Um, so this happens every year. And what they decided to do is to make it into a march for charity. So they pledged to donate I don't know a uh, hundred uh, euros or something like that for every meter they marched. So the Nazis were basically marching against themselves because the money in the end was donated against an anti-fascist organization, you know, that helps fascists go out of, uh, of the fascist movement. I thought that was just brilliant, brilliant. It's, it's really a sort of a, an example of, uh, uh, yeah, sort of a humorous and also, I think, in the end, more effective way to, um, to combat the enemy here. Because let's be honest here, what do, want, what do these fascists want most of all? You know, they want to be punched. That's really what they want because it helps them to to recruit. You know, it, it fits their narrative that they are these oppressed people, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't think we should help them in that regard. I mean, I, I'm personally minded um, when I think of the Tower Hamlets thing and the kind of mm -hmm. the community self-defense thing. I think that's that's kind of what that's where I, I stand on it. Mm -hmm. But I, I do suppose, again, empirically, there's the question. If you look at, for instance, um, the rise of neo-Nazism in the in sort of immediate post-Trump era, so 2016, and we all remember seeing Richard Spencer, you know, mm -hmm. hail Trump, hail our country, et cetera, et cetera. There is a really strong argument, and obviously many people went completely overboard with that. Mm -hmm. Anti-fascists went completely overboard. There is, mm -hmm. there is, a, there is. A, you should always be appropriate with your actions. Um, but there is an argument to say that the far right in the kind of slipstream of Donald Trump couldn't organize in a way that it wanted to because people would were a actively and aggressively breaking up their assemblies. Do, do you not buy that argument? Because mm -hmm. I mean, 
to be fair, the far right in the US hasn't really hasn't really moved on in, in three or four years. Marley Yiannopoulos mm. is finished. Richard Spencer's out of the sort of he's gone. Alex Jones has gone. I mean, a lot of that's because they've lost their media platforms. Yeah. But it does feel like the kind of zero tolerance approach with the far right. I'm not look, the left in the US is, is, has been decimated. Trump's probably going to win a second time. I'm not saying, you know, it's all working out perfectly, but there may be as a counter argument there. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Someone would have to sort of really make a proper historical sociological study for it. But my gut feeling is that uh, just like sort of the civil rights activists of the 60s, you know, they wanted to be punched by the police because that helped their narrative, right? That's really, and they they sought it out, you know, Martin Luther King and, 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 King and his allies, uh, because that really helped them. Uh, I'm afraid that you'll have a similar dynamic if you, uh, if you punch Nazis. Um, but maybe, maybe more research is needed there. I, I, I mean, probably more inclined to agree with you on, on, on some of this than uh, I may have been several years ago. Um, you certainly shouldn't certainly shouldn't start a fight that you you can't finish uh, without the intervention of the police, because that that will often happen if you've got a big group of far right thugs and there's just you and a few mates. You probably don't want the police getting involved. And I mean, I also like this observation. Who who said it? Sort of the anarchist who said um, that we should start living today as if we were already free. So, I mean, in my sort of utopian world, people would have the courage to turn the other cheek, right? I think that's, it's often been dismissed as um, naive or idealistic or whatever, but I think it's actually a really courageous act, just like these Norwegian prisons who are basically turning the other cheek to people who've done really horrible things. I think there's there's real courage in there. Um, do you think do you think that comes from? And I'm going to say, as somebody who's sort of white passing man, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're kind of similar, both authors, etc. Do mm -hmm. you think that there's an a, a argument that that comes from a place of privilege, though? I mean, so for instance, I, I mean, I agree with you. I feel the same way when I see a sort of fascist. I think this guy's they fuck their life up. You know, they've got yes. they, they they completely misunderstand society. They're so alienated from themselves as human beings, but. Yes. Is is that because we're more privileged than, you know, say a black woman or a Muslim woman wearing hijab, do you think? Yeah, maybe. Maybe you're right about that. And maybe this is a problem in general with my book, right? Is how that I can write about sort of the good in humanity because I've been relatively privileged in my life, right? I've got lovely parents, lovely sisters, uh, live in a lovely place called Houghton where nothing ever happens here in the <laughs> Netherlands. Um, so yeah, you got to take that into account. But then still, I would encourage people sort of who feel they've become too cynical and feel hopeless that I hope that my, my book can be a corrective there. We're going to go to questions, but what I like about it, well, I'll come just on this point. What I like about this book is that you, 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 you sort of advocate a, a, a universalist vision of humanity. Mm -hmm. And it's something that the left hasn't done for, for decades. The idea of a, a universal essence to all of us. Uh, and you obviously see it in religion. Um, you see it in a degraded form with nationalisms uh, around the nation, around the sort of ethnic um, sort of, uh, collective but i think it's a really important thing the left's missed out on let's go to questions um i'll put them in the comments with the rocket emoji um rutger you've been quoted in the past stating that your works offer solutions to save capitalism is this still your intention that's from jacob lindgreen hmm. well I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think about this as well but to me this whole discussion about capitalism versus communism i know it's very American and it sort of seems to miss the point to me, right? There, there are many capitalist societies who are, you know, quite civilized. I mean, Norway is capitalist, Denmark is capitalist, but then we've got so much to learn from them in many respects. So I don't know uh, if you have a society that has uh, high quality healthcare for everyone, public ed education for everyone, uh, a universal basic income for everyone, and also still have markets. Would you still call that capitalist? I don't know. Maybe once you implement a universal basic income, maybe at some point your society would evolve toward to something else. But I think you you have to keep in mind here is that we had different versions of capitalism in the past, uh, in the 50s, in the 60s, for example, when we had way higher tax rates uh, up until 90% uh, for the very rich. Um, and these were also uh, eras when we had much higher economic growth, more innovation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I often don't really like the the whole discussion about, oh, are you a capitalist or a communist, blah, blah, blah. I prefer sort of to just look at what kind of specific policies people are proposing. 
I think, yeah, my, my response to that is even in the, because obviously I have the same thing you have is that you get attacked by the left. I wrote a book mm -hmm. on fully automated luxury communism. They say, well, hold mm -hmm. on, in this book, you still have markets. And I mm -hmm. say, well, you, you can have markets and it's not necessarily capitalism. I mean, actually, that's been, that was a sort of big part of left wing thinking, mm -hmm. uh, Ricardian socialism, sort of really until the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then that kind of conversation went. But that's that's a topic for a whole other day. I agree with you. I think uh, that the discussion can sometimes uh, sometimes loosen that nuance. This is a very, very good question, Ruka, um, about uh, here we go. Yeah, this is from Majd. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about honor based violence? People don't find it hard to carry out violence against, well, they might find it hard, but it happens relatively frequently, carry out violence against those closest to them, and often they don't regret it. Well done on the show, by the way. Hmm. Hmm. On a base violence. So where does that perhaps fit in there? So this is, I think, another gap in my book is that I haven't written enough about honor based violence and also about domestic violence. Now, I spoke to Lily Cole about this uh, for the Hay Festival uh, last week. And she mentioned this, this paper uh, where a, a nomadic and together tribe was studied. And they found that actually, um, when it, and th this was about domestic violence, is that once this tribe became more sedentary, also domestic violence started to go up. Um, I think that there's something intrinsic to being a nomad is that, I don't know, it, it seems to balance something out. But then when people become more sedentary, I mean, we talked about what, what a disaster civilization was. I mean, it meant the invention of hierarchy, it meant the invention of patriarchy, et cetera. Um, no, nomadic and together has lived in these relatively egalitarian societies, also equality between the sexes, like proto-feminist. But then civilization came along and it was sort of the start of patriarchy. I mean, this is another thing is, I mean, don't tell this to fans of Jordan Peterson, but actually the patriarchy is a highly uh, recent and sort of almost a natural thing, right? For 95% of our history, um, uh, the evidence suggests we have much more egalitarian societies. Um, so I think that's what you sort of got to look at. Also, when you look at sort of honor uh, killings, which is also about, sort of about uh, groupishness and tribal behavior, et cetera, et cetera. But I probably should have written more about that in my book. I think, I, I, no, I thought it was a great question. I mean, you've, you've kind of couched mm -hmm. it in the, uh, the agriculture sort of... Mm -hmm. Uh, pre-capitalist or pre-neolithic stuff. I think that's a good answer, actually. You, you talk about a great book, actually, Against the Grain. I, I bought it having read yeah. your book. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's um, fantastic. Really good book. Um, By J James C. Scott. So yeah. uh, he's one of those anthropologists who actually, a previous book of his is also really great. It's called uh, Seeing Like a State. And um, yeah, especially people sort of who are a bit technocratic and believe that the state can solve everything. Uh, they They... They really got to read their James C. Scott to, uh, you know, learn how to be a bit more humble when it comes to <laughs> sort of top down technocrats coming up with all kinds of wonderful solutions for the welfare of humanity. We'll take one more question. Uh, and I have to say, Rook has been kind enough to come on the show tonight. We've got 1,560 people watching. We'll have many thousands more after the show has ended. Uh, 800 likes. Let's get up to 1,000. Smash the like button before we finish. <laughs> Uh, Zerzan is good on pre-agriculture. Yeah, John Zerzan is a is somebody to think about, sort of primitivist. Uh, mm. One more question. This is a great question. Let's finish on this. Jordan Lyon. Rutger, how is the right neoliberal media overcome, or how do we overcome the right neoliberal media when no prime minister has become prime minister since 1979 without Murdoch backing? Love what you do. I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll catch that with, with mm -hmm. my final question as well is, how, how, do we, how do we translate these values and ideas into a political victory uh, and mm -hmm. i guess what's what's changed since the last time we spoke uh, which was january 2019 mm -hmm. is obviously sanders sanders lost mm -hmm. but he, he didn't lose to like a competent technocrat you know like a, a, a beto o'rourke he, he lost to joe biden yeah uh, who played a very dirty game similar yeah. similar things going on in the uk and i suppose what this why i'm asking this with in, in the context of that question is what became clear in both the uk and the us is that the center didn't really want to work with the left against mm -hmm. the right mm -hmm. uh, and in that context and you, you talked about the need to build coalitions and so on what mm -hmm. can be done to sort of forge a, a different kind of consensus and how we run society do you think well let's start with the good news so the overton window the window of what is seen as politically possible and acceptable the overton window has really moved and i think mostly in the right direction so if you look for example at joe biden's climate plan it's actually more radical than uh, Bernie Sanders' climate plan of 2016, 
right now. And it has like 30 times the clean energy commitment that Hillary Clinton had in 2016. So, uh, of course, I mean, Joe Biden is, is like a very depressing moderate in many ways. But if you zoom out a little bit, you actually see that things are going in the right direction. And I think you could make a similar case actually about sort of the conservatives in, in the UK who are sort of their spending looks look, looks more like the labor pledge of what, what was it, 2017, than their own financial plans. Um, so in that sense, activists and progressives have, have been doing a lot of great work. But as I said earlier, it would be wonderful to also lose an election or sort of win an election for once, you know? Um, how to do that? I'm absolutely no expert on British politics. You know, from a Dutch perspective, the whole British system seems pretty bizarre to me. Is that you have this system where, you know, you have lots of political parties that get, I don't know, 22, 3, 4, 5% of the vote and they don't get any seats in parliament. So in the Netherlands, we have a completely proportional system. You have 1% of the vote, you get 1% of the seats. Um, then it's much easier to, yeah, to get political representation in, in parliament. And also when it comes to the, sort of the whole media ecosystem, um, yeah, that's a really depressing fact about, about British uh, society is that so much of the power here is concentrated with just a couple of billionaires. I mean, that again, this would be unimaginable in the Netherlands. This is, I think, also important to, to do, just to, it helps you question the status quo, just to look at different countries and like, how do they do it there? And then they sort of sometimes realize that it's pretty crazy, you know, the, how the status quo actually works. Uh, one final thing. I think one of the strong criticisms of my work in general is that I write and think too little about power, right? So I'm a, I'm a guy who believes, believes in ideas. I like to emphasize that real change often starts at the fringes with people who are first dismissed as unrealistic and unreasonable, and then it moves towards the center and, it, you know, it can actually change the world. Um, I have put little or less thought in my career in sort of thinking about, um, yeah, sort of how the material difference or the, like the real power differences actually shape and change the world. And I think I probably need to do better here. And that's also why I, uh, in the in the last couple of months and years, I became, became more interested in sort of the importance of building coalitions. Because at some point, obviously, I mean, a crisis is a, is a great moment, is that you can sort of inject new ideas in the debate, uh, Milton Friedman made this famous observation, right? The neoliberal economist that a crisis is a moment where everything depends on the ideas lying around. But then we've got these ideas now. We've got great ideas lying around from <laughs> universal basic income to the Green New Deal to higher taxes on the rich. But we also got to have people in power there to actually you know, put them in practice. We need them there. So, um, yeah, I, I sort of recognize that that's a... a, a overall weakness in my thinking and um i'm going to try to do that do better there in the future maybe be the next book yeah maybe <laughs> uh you've been fantastic this has been navara media michael walker is back with tisky sour tomorrow evening um we're probably gonna have another crazy 24 hours in politics in this country uh well it's the same pretty much everywhere but with dominic cummings it's like the icing on the cake uh rookie you've been phenomenal thank you very much thanks for having me it was great uh, his book, his thanks book everyone great. for watching yeah, this book is very much worth reading. Uh, I'll see you again probably Friday evening. Good night.